and a very warm welcome to this edition of Strategic Importance. So in this edition of Public Forum, we'll try to analyze the India-Iran ties. Right, and join uh, Dr. Sridham Cholia, uh, who is uh, the Professor and Dean of the Jindal School of International Affairs uh, from the OP Jindal University, joins us on the panel along with Dr. A.K. Pasha, who has the Center for West Asian Studies in Vijayanu. And we are also expecting uh, Mr. Pramit Pal Chaudhary from the Hindustan Times in some time from now. Such diplomatic results really makes uh, a lot of uh, difference to the ties between two nations there. But uh, how important and how crucial do you think is uh, going to be this visit, Dr. Shodhya? I think it will break uh, a long uh, period of uh, cold freeze of relations which began during the war on terror when the United States uh, was threatening to, to likely to invade Iran after the fall of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Since then, India has been very gingerly uh, in its approach to Iran and now we know in hindsight that India did vote um, at the IAEA uh, uh, under American pressure against Iran and it's been topsy-turvy and it's not been uh, as smooth as uh, the geographical contiguity and, or the near contiguity of these countries and the regional requirements would uh, dictate. So what we've had is geopolitics, geoeconomics would require Iran and India to cooperate but the American um, uh, car has uh, cleared the pitch mm -hmm. and I think the Prime Minister was supposed to visit a number of times has been uh, put off and we still don't have uh, that high level uh, a government representative has gone. So uh, Madam Speaker is gone, it's a fantastic uh, opening and I'm sure these, you can call them maybe track two because they're not directly representing the government but they're going on behalf of the parliament mm -hmm. and I think this way uh, it will, they will definitely carry some message and they will bring back some messages and these uh, back channel are let's say, uh, uh, secondary diplomatic moves will probably help uh, bringing back the importance of geography and of how Iran and India's fates are intertwined because we share the same space. You know, we cannot choose our own geography. We are destined with it. And that is where Iran becomes so critical for India. That is right. And it's also important to uh, uh, look at the point that it's uh, Meera Kumar's uh, visit, uh, Mrs. Meera Kumar's visit is going to be uh, the first by any Lok Sabha speaker in the last eight years, the last in 2003 by Mr. Manohar Joshi. But it's very important here to look at the two parliaments. This, beyond the cultural bond, it is also, uh, it's important to look at the economic ties between these two nations and also the education program that we've had. Because one of the important uh, highlights of the education agenda of the Lok Sabha speaker's visit this time is that uh, she's also going to unveil a statue of uh, scientist J.C. Bose at Pardis Technology Park in University of Tehran Science and Technology. Now that's, that's really an important and an, a very, it, it leaves a great mark on the science and technology and of course the educational program that uh, we share with uh, between these two nations. Yeah, and Iran has been under the scanner for um, its suspected nuclear weapons program for a long time. A lot of scientists and these technical establishments have been blacklisted and have been subject to, uh, you know, United Nations as well as uh, Western sanctions for a long time. Uh, so transfer of technology as well as know-how with a country like Iran has been made controversial by the fact that the West has dominated the discourse on how we should look at Iran. But as uh, Professor Pasha just mentioned, I think uh, this visit, especially the stress on science and technology, sends out a message that uh, we do care about our own interests and uh, where there is a uh, congruence, especially on uh, the end game for Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and as well as on wider uh, sharing of know-how between relatively advanced uh, developing countries. Both of us have relatively advanced scientific establishments with original research that's, that's been right. happening. So uh, it shows that uh, there is something we can gain from them and vice versa. But then again, you know, it all goes back to whether we're tiptoeing around all these uh, blacklisted institutions and I, I'm sure we would have chosen a safe institution from the point of view of the Americans uh, insofar as this science and technology uh, cooperation is concerned. But the larger picture would tell us that at this time, um, with the tumult in the rest of the Middle East, uh, Iran has managed to uh, keep the lid tight on its own domestic opposition and is probably looking out for as many allies in the region as possible. There are occasional irritants where Iran, for example, talks about um, 
the freedom struggle in Kashmir and so on. But there is also a non-ideological and a more pragmatic side to Iran, and that is where India comes in. Mm-hmm. A, this is this is a very because we know of Afghanistan and Dr. Choli. I would like to have your comments on this. Iran is being looked upon as a key uh, factor there uh, in um, order to increase the access that India can have not only in Afghanistan but also beyond to Central Asia, and that's something which India is really uh, targeting at. It's a high capacity state. I mean, although. they have a uh, serious domestic dissent and the regime probably has lost its revolutionary sheen and has become you can say a shell of uh, its uh, in a post 1979 aura uh, there is considerable uh, opposition and i i'm certain that if there were free and fair elections um, and if ayatollah uh, khamenei himself stood for you know uh, office he probably would be voted out uh, so the Internal dissent makes it, uh, as uh, Professor Pasha said, uh, somewhat unstable and always like a tinderbox. But at the same time, it's a high-capacity state which has highly mobilized armed forces and uh, an ability to project power in the neighborhood. And we've seen that through, uh, you know, the auspices of Muqtada al-Sadr in on the Western Front in Iraq. Iran uh, is a major player, uh, and uh, which is why a lot of Western commentators. were uh, upset about how the strategic balance has been handed over on a platter by the Americans to Iran so Iran has grown in stature uh, in the region as a major player and it has a capacity to project power not only through its own revolutionary guards and its uh, regular military but also through proxies like Hezbollah in in Lebanon through Hamas in the Palestinian territories so Iran has power and uh, that must be acknowledged from a real politic sense yeah. i think uh, we have to do that too and so for a regional solution to afghanistan uh, if the americans uh, you know withdraw sooner than later let's say by 2030 it's possible or even by 20, late, late next year before the elections then we will have a situation where um, iran has to be brought in and has to have a say for various reasons not only because it's contiguous to afghanistan but also because this capacity it has to to able to be able to enforce some kind of a modest rivalry within Afghanistan and India and Iran uh, along with United with United States blessings uh, with Russia and perhaps some kind of tacit uh, understanding of of the Chinese can thwart a scenario where Pakistan takes back its old uh, strategic depth mm-hmm. and uh, continues to rule the roost in a post American Afghanistan so Iran and Pakistan of course have complex relations um uh, informed by the shia sunni divide and so on but at the same time uh, they cooperate on on various uh, fronts so it's important for iran to be considered as a linchpin in the region mm-hmm. um as well as of course you can call it a, whatever the americans call it as a trouble maker it certainly is and has a capacity to inflict violence in its neighborhood mm-hmm. um and in syria for example is playing a very negative role right now where it's it's very important here to uh, actually understand the role that uh, iran is particularly playing in the international arena and that means a lot especially if india is dealing with iran there are a lot of other factors that india has to keep in mind especially its relation today we are talking about uh, the india iran relationship and it's very important here to look at uh, iran's nuclear program because we know that over the last several years india has repeatedly voted in favor of the iae resolution iaea resolutions condemning iran's nuclear behavior right so dr pasha time and again we have heard analysts saying that uh, india and iran they are friends of ancient culture they have true cultural bonds and it's really time that it should not uh, india should not rather allow its uh, relationship with iran to be affected due to its closeness with the us but it's also very important to look at the stand that india has taken against the nuclear programs that iran has uh, had in the past and it has always suggested the way of dialogue to make sure that iran understands that this is not good for the entire world so how do we really look at this approach uh, that india has fought the example of qadafi's violent uh, end is not going to help the cause of unproliferating iran qadafi gave up weapons 2003 with some kind of implicit guarantee of regime security and said low low we will eight years down the line he is you know out with nato connivance direct nato presence so the example that it is set is going to mean that the iranian regime especially the more hardliners the ones who are pursuing the nuclear weapons option 
will say that this is our last ultimate deterrent against any future invasion. Mm-hmm. Gaddafi was a fool in giving up his weapons, and he must have ruined the fact in his final days when he was being hunted like a like a like a like a wanted criminal. So Iran, the Iranian regime, because weapons of mass destruction are often being equated with deterrence against stronger states. But if you actually look at internal politics, it's also deterrence against uh, a regime from being forcibly removed mm-hmm. or changed. And if the regime change hasn't become once again a kind of uh, 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 the the reason behind many of these humanitarian interventions, mm-hmm. uh, there is a very much likelihood that the weapons program will accelerate. One technical hurdle was the Stuxnet war, which the Israelis had used to disable and slow down the uh, Iranian nuclear program. So they may have lost some time in being able to weaponize. But I'm pretty sure, as Professor Pasha says, the regional environment right now is such that if Syria is also in line for a Gaddafi-like uh, uh, finish, then Iran will consider itself to be extremely vulnerable again. Mm-hmm. Although Obama is not Bush, and there has been considerable softening in the hard-handed militarist approach towards Iran, but there's still a number of hawks baying for blood. Mm-hmm. And we don't know who, I mean, presumably Obama will get re-elected. But if not, Iran has to think about regime security. And so the nuclear weapons program, uh, you know, they have no choice but I think keep on going down that line. It's very important here to understand. To see this pipeline taking place. Okay, so it's very important here to look at what exactly suits us and our interests, mm-hmm. that is in terms of the energy uh, resources and the dependence that we have in these nations. What exactly is in the best uh, of the interest uh, for India? Well, I think we need to diversify and have as many sources as possible. It's simple mm-hmm. logic. And uh, as Pramit mentioned, uh, the Saudis uh, have been uh, put forward by the Americans as alternatives for India's growing economy and for its hunger for energy, uh, alternatives to Iran. And unfortunately, uh, we have not, we didn't mention the uh, bigger Cold War that's happening in the region between the Saudis and the Iranians, of which the recent uh, so-called assassination plot in Washington was one instance. Um, and what this shows is that also among the oil suppliers, um, people do know that India is a major consumer, just as so is, as China. And so there will be internal rivalry and competition within OPEC uh, to try and get, gain access to these markets. And uh, that will, of course, uh, also complicate relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia further, because these two, uh, along with Iraq, and Kuwait uh, are the bulk of them. So all this means that, you know, for us, I think um, if the shipping route is, uh, is, if the transportation costs are down, we can even consider going further afield, like Venezuela. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's far from India, Latin America, but the Chinese are tapping into all that, right? And Chinese are even further uh, uh, than us from Latin America, uh, from, the, from the Asia side. So uh, it all makes sense for us to think of multiple uh, avenues. So Iran will probably remain one, but it is very likely, given the uh, difficulties that Pramit just explained, Mm -hmm. that Iran's uh, share of Indian gas uh, and and oil imports will continue to decline uh, over time and will probably be balanced out by other uh, suppliers. Until and unless there's regime change and, you know, there's wholesale transformation in Iran, which may then, you know, alter the political dynamics altogether. Also, we heard that India is also looking forward to attract more Iranian investment in the uh, petroleum sector in particular. That, of course, yeah. I mean, that uh, foreign investment, I think, as long as uh, the it skirts the sanctions uh, uh, umbrella and uh, can manage to sneak in, that will, uh, will be permissible. And I think that will, uh, of course, you know, Iran needs... Um, you know, hard cash and, and currency. At the same time, it also has ambitious state-backed enterprises mm-hmm. that would like to go out, but which have been capped because of the uh, overall uh, uh, climate of sanctions. So I think uh, they do look at it. You know, for us, it's, see, the timing of the speaker's visit uh, mm-hmm. is such that for us, Afghanistan is critical. Iran is important for us there. For the Iranians, generally, they need to uh, adjust to the Arab Spring and to the tumult in the region, and we'll look out for extra regional, mm-hmm. but uh, you know, relatively contiguous states like India, mm-hmm. which will be necessary for their uh, you know overall interests. So That's this is right. where we stand right now bilaterally. Okay.